The third video in this series will be designed to help you guys understand DNA. Now there's a lot of mysticism surrounding DNA in general, so hopefully this will help clear it up for you guys. Um, there's going to be a lot of information packaged into this video, so if at first you don't understand it, you know, by all means watch the video again, because it is relatively important information, and in the third, or in the next video rather, the fourth one on mutations, you're going to need a lot of this information to understand exactly the different types of mutations and what their implications are. This is the structure of DNA from a little bit of a distance. I'm sure most of you guys have seen this. It's a classical double helix structure developed by Watson and Crick many years ago. Now there are essentially three parts to DNA, and that is there's a phosphate um, side rails and sugar. Together these are termed the phosphate sugar backbone, and they're common throughout DNA. They're not what changes, and they don't code any information really. Now what does code the information are the rungs of the ladder. Those are called nitrogenous bases, and there's A, T, G, and C that's found in DNA. This, these are, what the, these are the, the subtle differences between the A's, the T's, and the G's, and the C's. As subtle as it looks, however, these make all the difference in the world, and they're responsible for coding every gene in our body. Now it's important that you guys understand also that all DNA does, by and large, is encode proteins. That's it. And so I'm going to be covering proteins a little bit later on in the video. Also note that what you guys know as chromosomes are really just DNA from a distance. See, DNA wraps around itself and wraps around these things called histones and solenoids and just gets all sorts of balled up and tangled up. And when you tangle up enough of a mass of it, you can actually see it, and that's what chromosomes are. But nonetheless, the information in DNA can be read in the order of the nitrogenous bases, going from a 5' end to a 3' end. Um, it's not important that you know the distinction, but simply know that there is directionality to it. So, you can start by reading the genetic code, as I stated before, by the order of the nitrogenous bases, that is the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's. Now, every three nitrogenous bases are collectively known as a codon. So, one codon is equal to, like, a CAG, or a GAC, or something like that. And each codon encodes an amino acid. Now, multiple amino acids strung together encode a, pro encode a protein. So, think of it as DNA, every three bases equals one amino acid, many amino acids equal a protein. And, and this is very, very simple and fundamental to um, biology. Now, there's also what's known because of this as a reading frame which means that if you were to, to screw up DNA by what's called a frame shift mutation, by either adding a base or deleting a base, everything downstream from that would be garbled. Because th keep in mind, every three bases equal a codon, so if you're taking one of the things out of it and shifting everything o over, you're, you're changing the order of where the codons stop and begin, and they're going to consequently encode entirely different amino acids and entirely different proteins as well. So this is very important, and, a, and the reading frame must be maintained in order to translate the proper amino acid that's desired for the given protein. It's also important to understand that genes have structures as well, in the sense of part of a gene is what's called the structural domain, and that encodes for actual proteins. That's the functional product. Whereas another, the other rather section of a gene is called the regulatory section, and that acts as a switch. So it's not either you have a gene or you don't have a gene. More often than not, genes can be easily controlled simply by switching them off, as opposed to completely deleting them. This is oftentimes what happens in evolution, in the sense of a gene will just get switched off, and but the structural part will remain. Now, also keep in mind, this is how atavisms work, which I discussed in my Proof of Evolution 3 video, where the genes don't simply get deleted whatsoever, they just get turned off, and in an atavism, they just get reactivated or switched back on. So, it's very important also to understand that this is a key mechanism that can be used to regulate genes also. Okay, so you've got your DNA, you've got your GAC, TAG, you've got your reading frame, you've got your codons and all of that, but how do you actually make a protein out of it? Well, what has to happen first, and this is what's called the central dogma of um, biology, is that DNA has to be transcribed into RNA. Now, the difference between RNA is very simple. It's simply that DNA is lacking an oxygen on one of the carbons. That's the only difference that in DNA is double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded, typically. So what happens is there's an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which goes along DNA when it's time to be transcribed, and it creates an RNA copy of the gene. Now this RNA copy then goes through what's called translation, and it meets a ribosome, which is an organelle in the cytoplasm of a typical cell. So the RNA meets up with the, the ribosome. It then goes and through um, various other types of RNA, such as tRNA and whatnot, the mRNA message and the codons contained in the 
RNA, are translated into amino acids. The protein is assembled by the ribosome and it exits. So what you have here is a message going from DNA to RNA to protein. And that is a central dogma of biology and it's very important and that's what controls absolutely everything in our body. A more interesting thing to note before we move on is that there are a lot more combinations of A, T, C, and G than there are possible amino acids. As such, several codons will code for a single amino acid. For example, CCT, CCC, and CCA, and CCG all code for the same amino acid. This is what's called of the, as the redundancy of the genetic code. And it's also very important because oftentimes what happens is it's just the very last letter that's changed. Because keep in mind, CCT, CCC, CCA, CCG, it's only the last letter which is changing and as such it's all the same answer. So pretty much anything with CC blank is going to be making a proline. And that's very important, and it's the foundation of what's called the Wobble Hypothesis, which I really don't have time to get into here, but if you want a good read, Wikipedia it. Another very important concept that you guys understand is that proteins, their, their function is absolutely critical and dictated by their structure. Proteins work typically by what's called like a lock and key model, and that is that they will only act with their receptor, with their substrate, with whatever, if the structure is absolutely lined up. Because keep in mind, DNA is, is coding for 3D molecules in space, and the structure of which is extremely important to their function. So proteins serve many functions. They serve as enzymes. They're the foundation of muscle. They serve um, as structural purposes too. They're collagen. Um, they also serve as transport. They serve as antibodies. They're, they're the, the workhorse of the human body, and, it, and any body really. And they're fantastically important. And again, they're all encoded by DNA. And once again, remember, the structure of the protein is what determines its function quite often. So how is the structure determined? Well, there are four substructures. There's the, the primary structure, which is the, the amino acid sequence. That is the, the order of the codons, the A, T, C, G, A, T. That, those are what's called the primary structure. It, it's just flat on, on paper. That's what you think of. Then there's a secondary structure, which is um, alpha helices and beta sheets, and that's not really important. So when you form all those together, then you get the tertiary structure which is um, a folded peptide, peptide being protein. And then when you get several peptides interacting with one another, that's when you get to the quaternary structure, and then you have like a fully formed and functional protein. So what determines then exactly how the protein will fold? Well, it's actually intrinsic given by the primary structure that is the amino acid sequence. See, amino acids have different physical properties in the sense of some of them are basic, some of them are acidic, some of them are polar, some are nonpolar, um, some of them have sulfur, and, and it, it, it all corresponds there. Whenever you take a protein and you put the amino acids together in the proper way, given that the conditions are right and it won't be denatured, it'll automatically fold into the correct, posi into the correct position. So but from the primary sequence, that is the DNA sequence, and the primary structure of the protein, which is the, the A, T, C, G, etc. of the amino acids, you get how the protein will fold, and it'll fold the same way every time. So remember, the protein, the way that it folds, is what determines its structure. So I hope that this is all coming together for you guys, because remember, you had the DNA, which goes to RNA, which goes to amino acids, which goes to protein. And the DNA is encoding which amino acids are going to be made, and those amino acids have certain properties which dictate how the protein will be folded. And as such, because those amino acids have those properties and are dictating how the protein is folded, that'll determine the protein function. So I know this is very complicated, and I know I'm doing a lot of redundancy, which has to be annoying for you biology majors. However, it's a complicated concept, and redundancy certainly won't hurt in helping the newbies get it. So make sure that you understand this concept, because it's very important. So this will essentially conclude my introduction to genetics, and this is very important to understand because my next video is going to be on mutations and the different kind of mutations, and when you understand exactly how DNA works, then you can understand the implications for each mutation. So um, thanks again for your time, guys. So those of you guys who are still kind of curious about it, let me go through it one more time real quick. DNA has A, T, C, G, etc. Those are nitrogenous bases. Every three of them make a codon. They code for one amino acid. Each amino acid has various physical properties which encode and determine the way that the protein which the amino acid makes folds. So again, DNA goes to RNA, hits a ribosome, turns into amino acids, and which fold correctly into proteins which determine the function. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much.